Welcome to Hiraith, the home of modern Welsh politics. With me and Kerry this evening, we have Dr. Philip Proudfoot, who is the interim leader of the Northern Independence Party. Hello, Philip. Hello. And we've got Councillor Dick Cole, the leader of Maybe on Kuno. Uh, good evening. Good evening, and thanks for being with us. So, if we could, just to start, for those who don't know anything about your parties or don't know that much about your parties, um, do you want to give a brief history of them and uh, sort of when they were formed and what their purpose is? Yeah, certainly. Uh, Moby and Curnow is a party very much like Plaid Cymru. Um, we want the historic nation of Cornwall to have greater self-government. And we've been in operation for, well, it will be 70 years this coming January. Yeah, we're a left of centre political party. It's all about devolution. It's about the environment. It's about many things important to people in Cornwall. And uh, we're just trying to get recognition, to be honest, and to be able to make decisions for ourselves. What about the Northern Independence Party? Slightly newer than that, but... Uh, slightly. So the Northern Independence Party started, I think, now two weeks and th two days ago. <laughs> so we're brand new. Uh, we started out as a Twitter account, which I made in a sort of joking, not joking way. And then suddenly I was like, oh gosh, there's a real sentiment for this now. And then slowly the joke institutionalized into now a party with 500 activists signed up over 180 in our slack too many that i can even cope with people messaging me demanding a membership system we, we're looking at it as quickly as we can appearances on itv and obviously the the, the party itself it, it emerged out of the, the 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 contradictions in the north south that have been revealed through COVID nineteen. We we're a product of that moment on the BBC where the where Andy Burnham uh, was treated appallingly by London and revealed the artificiality of, of this so called United Kingdom. What so what is the the issue of Westminster for for Cornwall? You know what what do you think you can do which would be better than the current status quo? I think the reality for Cornwall is that we live. You know, we operate within a UK state, which is about as centralised as you can get in from Cornish perspective. Obviously, in Wales, you've had a real devolved settlement and that's been growing year on year. So now you've actually got a parliament. Scotland's been able to get significant powers. And again, I think if you look back over the last few months with the COVID-19 um, situation, you've seen Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland been able to take decisions for themselves about what's best for the people in their areas. Um, if you come to Cornwall, you'll find that the, the local group that's looking at how you cope is actually a Devon and Cornwall Resilience Forum, which is basically mostly coming out of Devon rather than Cornwall. You've then got the government operating on a Southwest England basis, which links Cornwall into an area that stretches as far as Bristol and beyond. And then you've got other conservative politicians coming up with an idea called the Great Southwest, which is England, uh, which is three English counties plus Cornwall. And, you know, and our voice is basically submerged. Central government does not understand us at all. And they certainly do not have us to the forefront when they're making their decisions. And as I said, Cornwall is a historic nation, just like Wales. We've got the same cultural linguistic traditions. And we're campaigning for devolution because we think that the people who live in Cornwall know what is best for Cornwall and they can do a damn sight better job than the suits in Westminster. Philip, does that, that resonate with you and your approach? Well, the North, the North is interesting because, of course, what, one of the questions about the North is why is it never developed a sort of homogenous Northern identity, even though we share many, 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 there are many similarities between Liverpool and Newcastle and Manchester in their history of integration into the UK. Yet there's no sense of shit, except for a small period just after the Romans left. There's really no period in, in which there is a coherent sense of Northern identity. There's the notion of the North-South divide, but like a, a unified uh, set of uh, traditions, cultures and identities we don't have. But what we have is a shared experience uh, within the Union uh, of the UK and a, and, a, and a shared unequal relationship with Westminster. What we're doing now in the party is trying to actually build that sense of unity. So I was speaking to a journalist today who was asking me, you know, how, do, how, how will the North avoid the current situation, which is just that what happens now is Westminster gives us some scraps and then Manchester and Liverpool and Newcastle fight over those scraps. How can we like unify those cities together when they have such strong particular identities? So at our stage now, we're trying to look at, for instance, like a federalist arrangement. We're trying to put together a policy document and the ways in which we can um, 
we can move forward as a party. But the sense of alienation from Westminster we share, we share with Cornwall. Like if you go to Northum Northumberland, not Northumbria, Northumberland, that they're as distant as you like from Westminster and they feel distant. If you look at the, the spend on public transport in, in, in Newcastle and in the northeast where I'm from, it's five pounds per head, right? It's three thousand pounds in, in London. So we have that shared sense of alienation from Westminster, but we don't yet have that like unified sense of identity. The Tories are helping us build it though. Like every time, every time they go, they're building it for us. Because you saw with Boris getting uh, people furious with Boris for letting Andy Burnham get on the news and that what they said, he was doing his man of the people stick, you know? They're furious that they're actually leading to this sense of identity. And we look to capitalize on that because it's about time we had a sense of identity in the North. Do you see that identity as being one of the kind of key drivers? Or are you looking at the economic aspects as well? So I've been having conversations with people in, in Scotland in various movements around the economic question. And we do, like, the, the identity is, I would say, it's a potential asset, but at the moment a hindrance because people don't feel the same sense of unity that, that I'm sure people do in Wales and Scotland. So that's our, we've got to work with that identity question. But the economic thing it's much clearer that the economic realities across the north are shared. Of course, we have bubbles of wealth. We've got, you know, we've got Harrogates and, we, and, we, and, we, and we've got, uh, you know, like fancy parts of Newcastle. But nonetheless, like the shared economic similarities are, are, are where we can build a movement. And we are looking at the economic question. So like our plan going forward is we're going to, in the new year, as, as long as, as well as having a membership system, we're going to produce a six page mini manifesto called The Case for Northern Independence, where we'll have a, a page or two dedicated to what a northern economy would look like. And a lot of people, when they raise questions around that northern economy, they, they draw attention to like current statistics and current measurements of the economy, but there's never actually been a northern economy. So it, it doesn't, not a, not, we don't really have any material to work with here. So it's difficult to actually like project exactly what it would look like. Well, we can make sort of, we can, we, we can forward suggestions. We can talk about like, we talk about a green industrial rebirth, not revolution. We had that revolution. We're going to have the rebirth. So yeah, like I guess the economy is the center of it and we're really going to be centralizing um, green industrial rebirth as our central economic platform for now. What about, what about the Cornish take, Dick? You've got, you mentioned the very clear cultural linguistic history and position Cornwall has. How about the economic uh, side of things for devolution or independence in Cornwall. Yeah, absolutely. And, and to be clear, we're we're actually campaigning for devolution within the United Kingdom. So we're we're not in the same place as Wales and Scotland with their their independence movements. Yeah, Cornwall's got a fantastic strong identity. There is, to be fair, though, quite a bit of ambiguity and ambivalence with that identity. And if you were in Cornwall, you would experience that. In terms of our economy though Cornwall again and it's interesting to hear the point about the north south divide I think those of us who live in Cornwall or, or West Wales for example would actually see life very differently it's it's not necessarily just north and south it's also east and west and if you look at the figures for what used to be structural funding those areas with the lowest GDP I think the two lowest ones are Cornwall and West Wales and the valleys and again, that's, to me, not a surprise. How come that the poorest areas of the United Kingdom are the ones that are furthest away from the centres of power in Westminster? It, 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 there is a, a very strong causal link. Cornwall also suffers because we're not allowed to make decisions for ourselves. And over the many, many years, you've seen blocks created, which actually sucks jobs and investment out of Cornwall. And then you've got members of parliament and prime ministers who come to Cornwall on a regular basis, but they see as nothing more than a, a nice place to go on holiday with plenty of sand. That is a killer for us because people do not necessarily go to those rundown housing estates, people living in abject poverty. They're on the north coast of Rock, perhaps, um, eating at very, very posh, expensive restaurants, staying in expensive hotels. They don't understand or see the real Cornwall. And that's part of the job that we've got to make them see. I mean, you both talk about having this sort of either north-south or southwest to south divide, this feeling of disconnect from Westminster. And I'm sure that's a feeling that is plentiful in both Cornwall and in the north. Is that the political base upon which you intend to build yeah, so I, I see um, three bases on which we're building our, our movement. So like one base is establishing a common sense of identity for the North. 
which is long which has long evaded us and it's long overdue so there's that base the second is the economic case for independence and the third is a, a kind of like a social case if you like i i'm fed up like you know what happened in the last election right i'm i'm fed up of um of going home and just hearing reactionary views growing further and further and further in the north particularly hard for me was watching the uh, brexit party take the general march and turn it into their symbol that's not a symbol for the Brexit party. Ellen Wilkinson would turn in her grave if she knew that the Brexit party had taken the Jarrah March and used that symbol. And we've like allowed in the North the right to take control of our history and who we are and turn it into this sort of reactionary, exclusionary sort of, sort of nationalism. And we are an independence party, right? So we're, 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 we're engaging with that, but we're saying those traditions aren't yours. The history of the North is the history of trade unions and chartists and levellers and the general march and justice for Hillsborough and justice for all Greaves. And the mainstream parties have taken, this is, this, this is a sort of social based argument I'm giving, the mainstream parties have taken two positions. Under Jeremy Corbyn, this was basically left alone to fester. There was no direct attempt to intervene in these reactionary views that were spreading across the North. And then now under uh, Keir Starmer, you see them sort of beginning to move towards like uh, appropriating them a bit you know his nods to patriotism we know his nods to patriotism are not going to be about the history of the trade union movement his nods to patriotism are going to be about throwing migrants under the bus that's what that nod is and and and, and that's a sort of blue labor instinct which i reject and a lot and all of us in it project because anyone who's actually from the north knows that these people are actually a minority but they're just given all of the airtime so then people, more they hear these people going to a, a, a Weatherspoons in Leeds and interviewing someone with reactionary views and they put him on the Guardian front page and they say, that's the North. It, you know, it really annoys me because it's, it's like me coming to London where I live, speaking to a black cab driver and saying, that's London. That, so we're resisting on that social level and directly intervening um, on, on those questions because many people, my father voted for the Brexit party in Sedgefield, Tony Blair's old seat. He, he walked into a working men's club and voted for the Brexit party, but he would not have, if he had an option for a sort of a socialist Northern party, he and many people in that constituency would have voted that way, but they felt betrayed by labor. My dad doesn't agree with all of the reactionary policies in the Brexit party, but he does. He, he felt that democracy was under threat, so went and did that and went and, and, and ticked that box. So we're trying to build on that social base as well. We're trying to like take the sting out of the sort of reactionary views that have been allowed to fester in the north for too long, um, and trying to reclaim that history. So that so that's the three bases of the party as I see it. What about you, Dick? Obviously, there's this the political distance, but how much of a sense of sort of Cornishness is there upon which to build for you? There is a very, very strong sense of Cornishness, but the reality of modern Cornwall is that uh, there, there's been a, a large number of people that have moved to Cornwall that um, to make Cornwall their home, and uh, many of those people are very supportive of Cornish aspirations for more local control others are not so the the demographics now are very different from what they were 50 years ago i think that as we've been commenting on the labor party i'll just join in for a minute um one of the highlights of our campaign if you like for greater Cornish self-government was in 2000 we actually launched a declaration campaign for a cornish assembly and this was after the labor party was promoting devolution and in a period of about 18 months, we had 50,000 people sign those declarations. Now, that is 10% of the Cornish electorate had actually signed up demanding devolution. And I remember 12th of December 2001, dropping it off at the 10 Downing Street. We didn't even get an acknowledgement. We didn't even get a go away. All we got was complete and utter silence. Later on, we did get some freedom of information request data where we actually saw briefings for Labour ministers, which was actually saying, oh yeah, they're, in, they're, they're making a lot of noise, but some of the, there's other voices in Cornwall that really all they want is local government reform and have one unitary authority. So instead of having devolution through a Cornish assembly, we'll basically take away their seven councils and give them one council and it will give them a strong voice, which has actually been a, really damaging to our case because now everything is through the context of local government. Cornwall is a, a local council area and in the government eyes 
they you could be talking talking about Rutland or Leicestershire or wherever, and and it's truly truly damaging. And linked to that, we also were successful in getting the government to acknowledge the Cornish actually existed, if you like, in 2014 when they recognised us as a national minority through the Framework Convention for the Protection of National Minorities. Obviously, that covers the Welsh, the Scots, and the Irish, but you don't really need to know that because you've got devolution, you've got rights, you've got a, a political system that understands you. And when they accepted that recognition in April 2014, they signed up to all manner of obligations and they have absolutely failed across the board in the last six and a half years. They signed up to say more support for the Cornish language, they've given us less. They accepted they would recognise us and the key battle recently, a simple thing, was your, you know, the government saying Cornish treat you the same as the Welsh, the Scots and the Irish. And we said, great, we'll have a tick box on the census so Cornish people can tick their identity. No, you can't have that. Too complicated. Other people will want stuff as well. So it, so they're basically saying we exist, we've got traditions, they're, they're there for us, but there's no actions coming through whatsoever. And that's the really frustrating thing. And too many people in Cornwall in the political set are just trying to do what they can but it's within us it's a, a straight jacket of what you might term english local government and that it's it's appalling so we were thinking about like trying to push northumbrian as a, a on the census as well so maybe that's a dead end <laughs> but yeah i mean like obviously when it comes to devolution the north has got some of that shared history because in 2004 we were offered the regional assembly for the northeast i think i was 16 at the time 17 and I remember, I remember campaigning against it <laughs> because, because it was very clear to me at the time it was just going to be a new Labour fob off. It was just going to be an expensive talking shop. What's the point of, of spending more money on a thing that would have had no actual substantial powers? And it, it looked to me like a dead end. And I, I, can, I can remember that vote and it, and it failed by a huge margin. 80% voted no um, to, the, to the regional assembly in the North East. Um, and that's why, I mean, we're going hard for independence. And the reason we're doing that is otherwise, I just don't think we'd be getting the press. I just don't mm. think we'd be getting attention. Like, I want independence. I don't want another West Lothian question. We're not going to have a Northumbrian question. We're going hard for independence. And, that, and, and the weakness of devolution has been revealed all the time. And that's why we're sticking with that demand. And we'll accept nothing less. <laughs> I think there's a lot of people in Wales who, who you know, who, sim who hugely sympathise that, with that, especially those who know a bit about Welsh devolution and the sort of uh, slow trudge we had from administrative devolution in the early 2000s to where we are now. I wanted to ask you both about the growth in English national identity, really why you think that that is, and how both uh, a northern national identity and a Cornish national identity interact with that. Do you think that people would consider themselves Northern and English or Cornish and English? Uh, and, and how do you respond politically to that growing Englishness? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say from my perspective, I'm a Cornishman and I'm not English full stop. So um, when we're having a conversation about Cornish within the English context, you'll see me popping up all the time saying, no, 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 I'm, this is the Cornish context. And I do see it as very distinctive in the same way that you know, the Cornish language, the Welsh language, it's the same historic language that's diverged. And that that's the basis of our identity. It is a national identity. So I'm, I'm not really in a great position to talk about English national identity because it's a completely different thing to me. I'm, I'm in the same boat as you guys with that. I do think there is, um, historically though, it's oft, obviously England has often been dealt with as if you want devolution, it's a regional thing rather than, rather than a national thing. And obviously that has got more recently, I think people arguing for things like an English parliament. And obviously a lot of us in Cornwall, we're making the case and sure have an English parliament if you want, just don't include us. We'll have a Cornish parliament, please. You know, simple as that. Yeah, I think when, do you know the book uh, Socialism with a Northern Accent? It, be it, be it, be it begins with a, with a section where it discusses the, the notion of Englishness. Englishness, if you say it, what does that even mean? Does it mean like the post-industrial landscapes of Northeast England? I mean, in the popular imagination, Englishness is probably in the Southeast. It's probably not in Hackney. It's probably somewhere in the home counties, a, a quaint little village. The, the Englishness 
is already an exclusionary identity. And I don't understand how so many people have been caught up in it. Englishness is, it, it, it is to its very essence marked by class and location. And we already in, in Northumbria have places like, uh, you know, the Scouse identity. We know we're Scouse, not English. And Northumbria, Northumbrians as a distinct identity does predate Englishness. So it, it is an invented concept. It's, it's marked by class and location. And I meet, you know, people in London who I would think are quintessentially English. And when people think about quintessentially English, they're not thinking about Geordies, are they? They're not thinking about people from Manchester or Liverpool. They're thinking about people from the home counties. So I think people need to stop kidding themselves with this notion of Englishness because it's it, it, it's it, it's a fob off. It's not it's it's a it's it's a class marked construction. Your lived experience as a as a as a as a, as a northerner is so distinct from someone's lived experience as someone from the south. And I'm speaking as someone who spent a lot of my life in London, and I've met other working class Londoners. And of course, our situations are driven by the same motors, right? But ultimately. Our experiences are so distinct so like a working class Londoner can still get on a, on a bus and go somewhere relatively quickly and go to an art gallery and do and engage in all these like sort of benefits of the capital whereas in the northeast we don't have that so that, what is a unified English there's no unified experience here I, I reject the concept and that's why we're going really hard on the you know we're not English we're Northumbria so where do both of you think the British identity fits in with your movements does it I mean we're, we're very relaxed because I think Cordish people see themselves as British, no problem at all. In effect, um, I think we often make the old joke that, um, you know, it's the Cornish and the Welsh. We are actually the Britons, if you like, the ancient Britons that have always been on this island and our traditions have always been strong and continue through to the present day. So, yeah, from a Cornish perspective, we're, you know, we are very, very happy with our Cornishness, our Britishness. And also, I've got to be honest as well, there are a lot of people in Cornwall whose identities are more ambivalent and they, they're they very Cornish, but when England are playing football, they, they're very English as well. And other times they're saying, oh, I'm, I'm not English, I'm Cornish, but then they're, they're wearing their England football shirt or their rugby shirt, you know. So I, I have to acknowledge in Cornwall there, there is this strange people's identity a situation and but that's just the complexity of modern life and people seeing lives differently so I, it's not something I, I worry about too much but we're yeah we we are a British part of the United Kingdom so yeah I mean Northumbria is on the island of Britain so we're on that island but <laughs> but British I don't know like personally I don't I I don't particularly uh by myself identifying with Brit Britishness like I feel like I'm you know, I'm a Geordie first, uh, I'm a Northumbrian second, I'm third a British, Brit, and then, then maybe somewhere far, far away I'm English, <laughs> you know, but, but my, my experience, yeah, I think that it's just difficult to pin down what people mean by Britain. I mean, we're not leaving Britain, that's what we always say in NIP, we're, we're not planning to leave Britain, we're just leaving this thing called the United Kingdom, which by design has, ha, has pulled all of the opportunities, resources, infrastructure, people that we have in the North to the South. And that's what we want to leave. We want to leave that union. If people want to be proud of British history, that's fine. We're still in Britain. Just don't like this thing called the union. One of the drivers in the growth in Indie Wales movement at the moment isn't necessarily the kind of traditional national approach. It's the opposition to the Westminster government like what would you both say about how that government is your government or is that something which is driving your agendas those people that would consider themselves Cordish nationalists are very cynical and critical about what comes out of Westminster governments of whatever hue and I think some of the examples I gave you earlier in, in terms of the Labour Party and the 50,000 declarations was a good example but if you look at the present Conservative uh, government they don't get Cornwall at all you go back over decades we've had underinvestment, and that's why we're one of the poorest parts of the country and at the same time those same politicians again as I said before are quite happy to use us as a holiday destination but not as an area that's able to speak up for itself so opposition to Westminster is very much at the forefront of how we operate and we want decisions made in Cornwall but I've also got to say I, I in the last general election, the Conservatives won all six seats in Cornwall. 
and I don't understand it. Um, in Cornwall, even though there was a very strong level of investment into our area because of low economic performance from the European Union, there was still a massive buy into the Brexit campaign. And I, I think it's, um, I can't remember the exact figures, I think it was like 55, 45 was it in terms of pro-Brexit when it came to the referendum in 2016. And that completely was the big point in the general election in 2019 that people totally bought into we've got to make Brexit happen. And I think the big frustration for me was there were so many people that were putting the blame of the ills of Cornwall at the door of the European Union when actually those that were more culpable are the MPs and governments in Westminster. And that is a real shocking indictment. And I just hope that as we go forward, you know, Brexit is going to happen and then you're going to be in a situation that there is no one else to blame. And hopefully then people will see through a bit more that how we've been failed by Westminster. Bill, do you want to pick up on that? Because you mentioned um, your father and uh, that kind of idea that uh, the areas have been betrayed by Labour. And, you know, it's, it always resonates for me, the Mary Black speech where she said, I didn't leave Labour, Labour left me. Is yeah. that kind of idea yeah. behind some of what you're thinking is? Yeah, that, I mean, the question, the question of the North's relationship to Westminster is such a, a, a big and vast one. And, and the problem with the North's relationship with Westminster is like, it's a really vast question. So the first thing to get out of the way with is that people have been talking as if when we go independent, that would mean that we would now have a Tory government. Actually, no, the North still overwhelmingly, even in the last general election, would have a Labour administration. So... It's, it's not that we've just suddenly uh, turned into a, a Tory a safe space, you know, safe, safe space, uh, safe constituents. We don't have that. But we have, with Brexit, we have to look at the distinction between 2017 and 2020. That's uh, 2019. That's key. Is that in 2017, we recovered some of the votes that we've been historically losing in the North. So like places like Sedgefield and North West Durham had a recovery of their overall collapsing vote share. And that was because the radical policies of the Labour Party resonated with the conditions in the North and they didn't seek to challenge the democratic decision of the North to, to leave the European Union. And people don't, didn't, ne people, because I was in the South at the time for all of this and I was hearing how people in the South think about Brexit in the North and they didn't understand that people in the North, however wrong they are, felt they voted for a radical project. And then Labour in 2019 comes along and says, you can't have that radical project. Here's another radical project. And, the, and my position on that is that the disconnection with Westminster happened when Labour should have been saying, every time Boris Johnson said, get Brexit done, Labour should have been saying, get Brexit right, and said that this manifesto is a Labour Party Brexit. And, we would, and they would never have lost their urban supermajorities, but it just shows how far the disconnect is from the North that MPs in urban supermajorities in London were dictating party policy. When they have people like Ian Lavery and John Trickett calling them up and saying, this is a serious problem, and they were ignored because the North has been ignored by the Westminster elite. Right? That, 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 and that, that change in policy from 2017 to 2019 shows that disconnect from the Westminster elite and the North. And that's why I've left the Labour Party. I used to be a, a, a Labour Party activist, but I've left now because I don't believe any of these things are ever going to be substantially taken seriously. Because if they weren't taken seriously under Jeremy Corbyn, they're never going to be taken seriously under Keir Starmer. Keir Starmer is already quite clearly in the process of re reorientating Labour towards picking up those soft Tory seats and abandoning the North. I think that's quite, it's quite evident to me that that's what he's doing. That's why I feel that we just have to move away from that and build our own party for the North that connects the Northern values, which are the values of mutualism, solidarity, support, fairness, openness and warmth that we know the North to be, rather than allowing Keir Starmer, when he's even interested in the North, to start pandering to the worst among us. And, and, and that's one of the, you know, the personal sort of relationship with Westminster that led me to start the party, is, this feeling, is watching that collapse happen and knowing it was going to happen. What sort of relationship do both of your parties have with uh, Plaid Cymru and the SNP? And have you reached out to either of those parties for support? I'm sure, I think, Dick, when we spoke before, you've told me you've had a bit of history with Plaid Cymru. 
I've been a member of Plaid Cymru since I started my university education at Lampeter back in 1988. I was for a couple of years um, the secretary of the local Plaid Cymru branch and it's the first time I spoke politically was for Plaid at the university when there were a couple of hustings and all the other mostly Welsh people in the university branch, none of them would actually go and put themselves forward to, on the platform to debate. It was me, little Cornish boy had to do it. And um, yeah, and when I got to have a go at the uh, conservative student who wanted to do away with grants, I got a standing ovation. So I suppose that's what's got me on this track. Plaid have always been really, really supportive of MK. Obviously, it's quite frustrating for us sometimes when we hear everybody talking about the four nation solution at the moment, which is obviously England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland. But in terms of Plaid, the amount of Plaid Cymru members that have come to Cornwall to speak at our events is phenomenal. Members of Parliament, Assembly members. It goes back to Gwynver Evans in the 1970s. I've shared a platform with a large number of absolutely fantastic people that are really, really supportive. I'm proud to maintain my Plaid Cymru membership. And it was great to be at the conference last year in Swansea and, you know, seeing the real vibe under Adam and hopefully it will lead to good results this this coming May elections. SNP, obviously MK is a member of the European Free Alliance with the SNP, also the Yorkshire Party. So we do have some links. We've had a couple of SNP people speak at our conferences over the years, but we don't have much of a relationship, if, if I'm honest. And obviously through the EFA, we've had quite a lot of conversations with the Yorkshire Party. Um, but basically it's Plaid that's been really outward looking and supportive of other movements. Philip, a bit closer to the SNP probably than uh, well, we've, we've, geographically, but... We'll also be sharing a border with Wales, pretty much. Right. If, if, we, if we take Chester, <laughs> Cheshire, sorry, Cheshire, sorry, we'll be, we'll be sharing a border. And we've got the Wirral. So just course, not not yeah. that not that too far not too far no. but yeah I have had talks with people with some people in the SNP who are giving us a bit of advice at the moment just to help get things started and and helping with our sort of economic policy as we develop it because obviously it will rely on any economic policy will rely on a close relationship between Northumbria and um, and Scotland we've had huge amounts of support from uh, the Yes Cymru people on Twitter. I, I've, uh, I've got a lot of friends who are in that movement and have been giving me little phrases to put out in Welsh on, on our Twitter, like Northumbria and Wales are walking in one hand. And then we keep, then Yes Cymru keeps like endorsing it and retweeting it. And then I, I, I retweeted something from Yes Cymru. And then do you know the Chapel House podcast in America? It's one of the biggest politics podcasts in the world. They saw that, then retweeted that, and then basically signal boosted Yes Cymru and the Northern Independence Party. So we have had like, obviously we're brand new, and within, within the slack that we have to try and lay the foundations of the party, we do have some members of the SNP and some members of Plaid Cymru helping us out because, you know, it's just so new that we need the experience of our other secessionist friends to help us like develop this, develop this movement. But yeah, no, we would... With Scotland, it's obviously going to be a very close relationship. I mean, there's already joking people asking us that, you know, for a free trade agreement, we're going to have to give them back Berwick upon Tweed. <laughs> like, there's lots of discussions already going on. But yeah, we look, we look for good relationships. MK have uh, operated for quite a while as, as what I think a lot of people in the media would consider a bit of a smaller party. What is, the, what is your experience of operating in that guy is not always able to get as much media attention as you would like? Obviously, and when we talked yeah. to Philip about this, it's NIP have had a lot of attention in the last few weeks. And do you expect that to continue? And what sort of lessons do you think uh, mm. you can learn from a party like MK that's been doing this oh. for a long time? The main thing we need to do now is we need to formalise and we need to learn how to formalise as a political party because it's just absolutely chaotic at the moment. We're, we're, like we, we've just had our first general meeting last week where we started to appoint positions, interim positions until we have a membership system and we can have party democracy. But we have like, there's so much we need to learn. Like I'm, we're very good at comms. So that's why we're getting all of this attention. We're also capitalizing on a particular historical moment. So we're able to gain attention that way. I've got pretty good press contacts. So like it's, that's how we're able to get this stuff going. But when it comes to like running the actual party, we have to learn from much more established parties because it's just, it's an absolute mess at the moment. <laughs> but it's moving, it's moving. Our aim 
new year membership system plus six page money mini manifesto that's our goals for january and then halfway through the year we're aiming for a first virtual party conference leading up to the local council elections so Dick, going back to that question, how, how yeah. hard has it been for MK to operate as a sort of a quote unquote smaller party within the traditional Westminster system? It is such hard work. It's unbelievable. I think when, if, when we started off, obviously you could argue that MK was a cultural movement that had a political overtones and then has shifted to a political movement that's bedded in a, a cultural origins. And when we started fighting elections in the late 60s, we were still a pressure group where people could be members of MK and other political parties. So we had the situation that we were putting forward our first ever parliamentary candidates and some of the MPs were actually members of MK. But again, the lesson from that, if you go back historically, they may have been sympathetic, but when push came to shove, the priority was always the Liberals or the Conservatives or the Labour Party, it was never, you know, the Cornish movement, if you like. And I think for us as well, Cornwall isn't perceived by the UK state as a whole as a large area. And when we're trying to get coverage, it is very, very difficult. We don't have our own media in Cornwall when it comes to television. From living in Wales for a few years, I know how difficult it is to get the message across in Wales. Okay, because you've got in effect what you might term local television, but you've still got the main news coming from London. The newspapers, again, you might have the Western Mail, but most of the people are really in the Mail, the Express, the Mirror. So I know how difficult it is in Wales. If you extrapolate that times 10, that's what it's like in Cornwall, where the regional media, a lot of the newspapers are actually based outside of Cornwall. So we haven't even got our local media within Cornwall. The best we can say is we've got Radio Cornwall, which is a a local radio station, no different from an English county. So for us, it's, it's trying to get the publicity. Maybe we've not been outrageous enough on many occasions. And when we do have great successes, like getting one tenth of the population of Cornwall to back devolution in 18 months, the coverage we got for that outside of Cornwall was negligible. I can tell you exactly what it was. Imagine it, you've got a tenth of your na- of your nation saying, we want something, we've been to London. And the coverage was a couple of paragraphs in The Guardian and God bless them, the Morning Star. That was it. Yeah, so we're, we're still campaigning. And next year for us, it's actually the local election. So I'm up for re-election. I've been a councillor for 22 years. So I'm up for re-election with three of my colleagues on the only council that's Cornwall's got left, the Unitary Authority, uh, only principal council. We also are be finding our democracy is denuded because I mentioned before how we wanted an assembly and we had local government reform foisted upon us. Prior to that, Cornwall on its councils had 331 elected members. When they imposed a single council on us, that was reduced to 123. And now we've had authorities in London have said 123 is too many you've now got to have it reduced and now we're going to have 87 councillors for the whole of Cornwall so I'm going to be representing the best part of 6,000 electors next year if I get re-elected whereas I've, I've obviously the average in places like Wales is a uh, is less than half of that especially when you go out into the more rural areas you know so it's been a real struggle for us to keep fighting but we are because it's the right thing to do And it's trying to get that strong message out into the media when what's being presented is not someone else's stereotype, which I know Philip was talking about a bit at the very beginning. So, Dick, I think you mentioned that you're quite uh, the aspiration is to have devolved kind of power in an assembly approach within the the wider UK, whatever that might be. Yeah. Um, But one of the things we've talked about in previous pods is about federalism and confederalism Mm -hmm. within the UK which would probably fit into your kind of view of a uh, potential future, Dick. But what about you, Philip? You know, is it indie or bust? Or would you see a a reformed UK and a federal structure an aspirational target for yourselves as well? I mean, what we're going for independence, but within within Northumbria, we do want to use a federalised system. So, so like, for instance, when I spoke to the journalist at The Independent, he, he said to me, well, you're just going to create the same problems, but it's going to be in Manchester. So I said to that, why would we create a new country and then just repeat all of the problems of the United Kingdom? 
we would look to have a federalized system within Northumbria, which protects those, uh, those local identities, Scows, Man, Geordie, and then we have a unitary uh, legislative body for all of those like truly devolved powers, because I'm sure you all know, like we, we have the least devolved forms of political power in all of Europe in the UK, we're the most centralized beyond any imagination. So we are looking at federalism, but federalism within an independent Northumbria. You know, when we, when we sweep in in 2024 and we have MPs in every northern constituency and we say, give us a referendum, if they want to negotiate some sort of federalised system, we'd consider it. But what we want is independence. So we, we don't want to make, we don't want to go through the same thing Wales has gone through, that slow march towards greater and greater and greater. We want, we, want just, we want a clean break, a clean break for Northumbria. So that's what our demand is. We're demanding an independent Northumbria. And we're not talking here hard borders. Of course, we can't have a hard border. But we also like ideologically, one thing we all agree on in NIP is that the North-South divide is, is built into the very fabric of the union. Like it's built into the very nature of the UK. There's no point at which Westminster will look to the North and fully implement all of those dusty filing cabinets of proposals about how to address this problem. Why want to do that? Because it just means tilting the balance of power. So why would they willfully tilt the balance of power to the North? If they, would have, if they were going to do that, they would have done it already. We would, we've heard about a powerhouse for 10 years. Before that, we had like new labor regeneration and all of this. And it's not gotten better, it's gotten worse. And COVID reveals that it's gotten worse. The case for independence is, is, is that every single uh, negative impact of COVID-19 is magnified in the North. Why? Because of this structure of inequality that's been left unaddressed for centuries. I, I put out a tweet today saying, you know, the harrying, of, the harrying of the North never ended. It just turned into a political and economic structure. <laughs> I think the people that talk about federalism don't understand federalism, to be honest, because um, in Cornwall, the dominant political force for many, for most of my life was actually been the Liberals come Liberal Democrats. And the relationship we've had with them has been them merrily parking their tanks on our lawn, I think is the expression, but then promptly not actually doing anything. And... And it was the Liberal Democrats working with the Labour government that actually brought forward the unitary authority. And, you know, I've, I'm, I'm actually writing an article for a book at the moment. And I think when you look back over a period and dig out some of the old files, it gets quite depressing, doesn't it? Because I don't remember that happened. I did my best there. And it was, again, we had the Liberal Democrats saying how much they were going to push for Cornish Assembly. They then got into the position they had control of Cornwall Council, Cornwall County Council. They had all five of Cornwall's MPs. And then we thought, great, they're in a fantastic position to really push for it. And it was at that point they turned tail and said, oh, let's do local government reform instead. And more recently, I've seen that they've been the ones promoting federalism. And at their recent uh, virtual conference, they did just that. And I, I read the motion down and it didn't mention Cornwall at all. You know, it was talking about federalism, but it was in the context, again, of England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. And the person pushing it, she even had a really long title, which involved England, Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland. But we were non-existent. I mean, one of the phrases I often use is, as Cornwall is a nation, we are the invisible nation of the United Kingdom. You know, we've got all the attributes but we're just not recognised by the people in the centre in power. That's what we keep having to fight against. i got to say, what I'm really looking for is I want a devolution night like you guys had in 1997, where you actually have a fantastic result, albeit tight, and then have a fantastic party afterwards. I spent the entire night with you guys having a most wonderful time. And uh, so that's what I'm after. I want my party like at the Park Hotel for Cornwall, so... Oh, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. Um, so, you know, I think you've both mentioned the future and where you things are going, local elections and uh, quite ambitious general election in 24 for, for you, Philip. But do you want to just summarise before we finish, um, you know, the future for both parties and what your aspirations are? Short so the, the main thing we have to do right now is the membership system, because I keep saying to everyone in the Slack, you know, we're, we're relying on volunteers' goodwill and eventually everyone's going to burn out. And 
I mean, I can look at the statistics for how much people are engaging in our like workspace and the engagement level is still really high. We've like broken everything down into groups where people are formulating the economic policy, environmental policy, cultural policies, and that we've broken all that down. We're trying to harness that energy. But unless we start getting some sort of income, we're not going to be able to pay for people's deposits. We're not going to be able to produce materials. Like that's the first, the first step. And we want to capitalize as quickly as we can on all this attention we're getting. Because I get inboxed on Twitter and then on you like a uh, press email not press people, I get press people as well, but I also get people just using that email to say, where do I sign up as a member? So that's our first step is to start getting a bit of like a bit of money behind us so we can actually contest elections. And then we're going to be working with um, various different bodies to put together this manifesto outlining the economic case for independence, because I don't think there's, there's never really been any serious economic and political analysis of what might an independent North look like. So we're putting bits of statistics together to try and point towards that future. So we're pointing out, for instance, that if the North went independent, we would have the same GDP per capita as uh, Sweden, right? So like, it's not trying to, 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 to sort of build the idea that an independent North is not an impossible thing. We have 15 million people. So we're still constantly in, going into the near future, gonna have to just keep pointing out to people just how viable this country actually is called Northumbria. And then as we move then forward, we'll move into a party conference, which will have to be virtual unless this vaccine works out, which was great news. I was, I was putting out today, you know, we've got rid of Trump, we got the vaccine, and now all, that le all that's left is sweeping in in 2021, getting elections, getting elected MPs in 2024, and 2025 getting our referendum for an independent North. So that's our, that's our long-term plan. <laughs> And stranger things have happened, you know, we can, like right now in this sort of chaotic period in which we live, this is the time where these movements might actually, be, it might be possible to be born. And it's not like we're starting from ground zero. That resentment towards Westminster has been built for centuries in the North. So we're not, so on an emotional level, on that sense of disconnect, we aren't actually starting from ground zero. We just have to form it into a political party and stop it being directed towards migrants and refugees and the EU and whatever, all these false targets and point it towards the thing that actually causes immiseration in our communities, which is an uncaring Westminster elite. So that's like, yeah, that's the objective going forward is to build on this strategy, build on this momentum. And in Cornwall, yeah, our immediate focus is the local elections coming up to try and show there is actually an alternative. And I would say to Philip, actually, get in, if you're fighting for elections, you've got to start fighting local elections before you get anywhere near parliamentary elections, because they're the, the fairness, if you like, of the contest is much greater. You, you can get out there in a much smaller area, promote a good candidate, get your good messages out. We struggle, for example, in general elections because we're perceived to be part of England. So if we stood, as we have in the past, and stood in every single Cornish seat, we aren't even allowed a television broadcast. The reality last time was if you want a broadcast, you have to stand in every Cornish seat, they told us, plus 83 seats in England. Because they basically say you have to stand in one-sixth of the seats of the nation you're in. So us standing for all six in Cornwall meant we got nothing. But if you're a Northern Ireland party, all you had to do was to stand for three or four seats in Northern Ireland and you did get a broadcast. It's, it's completely imbalanced. And so I would, I would say go for local elections if that's what you want to do. It's what the Yorkshire Party and the North East Party are doing, um, trying to get the message out there at that level. And I think also some of their best results were actually in mayoral contests where you covered a larger area. But I think the perception was it wasn't so much a parliamentary contest where people got less caught up in the, the dynamic about who's going to be prime minister. So that's a, that's a little bit of advice because it is very, very difficult to get your message out in parliamentary terms when you're ex you'll be excluded from the key parliamentary debates. You won't get the airtime and you know unless you make a massive build for it in terms of us in Cornwall we've got a lot of work that we're still doing and a lot of it unfortunately is very boring and exciting it's about trying to get the local council to up its game and instead of seeking devolution in an English context of a county it's about getting them to actually go for meaningful legislative devolution where you get an assembly or better and it's it's all the time it's every day banging away trying to get Cornwall's message out and 
I've been doing it for many years and I'm going to keep doing it until we get the victories we merit. The point I raised about the differential levels of election, I think the point is made in Wales as well, I think, in terms of Plaid Cymru getting 10 or 12 percent in, in an English general election, if you like, but they could poll 20 to 30 percent in a, a Cardiff general election. So and it's very different about how people vote differently at different levels of government. And it's uh, that's, that's a clear thing to understand as groups go yeah. forward. So. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, on, on that point, yeah, I totally take it that we should be planning for the local uh, local elections. And I, I agree with what you're saying. I think we do stand a, a much better chance of that. And another tactic we're doing to build towards that is we've already, we, we as soon as we started, we set up a community organising uh, working group. So we're going to try and be like out there in the community, in the food banks, assisting people so they can like see us and meet us and just spread the word of mouth beyond the internet. Because we've done very well on the internet. But you know, that... You know, one person on Twitter might tell three or four other people, but it doesn't actually reach very far. So we're also, we're, and, and I was uh, personally, I knew a lot of people in the Labour Party's community organising unit, and I always felt that that was something that should have had far more attention, uh, far more funding towards, because that was that was an effective uh, part of the party that was entirely, uh, well, it wasn't entirely, but it was experimental. And it looks to me now that it's starting to disappear. So we've got lots of people who are experienced in that uh, community organizing who've taken part in the Slack and joined that channel to try and build that sort of, to become like you say, like a local party that people we have, we're dedicated to having candidates from the, from the areas they want to represent fundamentally. So that's the sort of tactic we'll be pursuing right now. Yeah, yeah. we want to contest in the general election as well, uh, just to, you know, attempt to create a bit of a stink. <laughs> <laughs> and also, you know, I, I'm always hearing from people saying, oh, you're going to, you're going to take away the. You're going to take away people's votes from Labour. I mean, we don't know who our voters are yet. We want to see who our voters might be. Our voters might be those people who switched their vote to the Tories in North West Durham and Sedgefield. We might take that vote, and not that I'm saying this is a particularly good thing, but we might take that vote, and that might actually help Labour. It's not actually clear who's going to be voting for a Northern Independence Party yet. So. I'm not, in, and I'm not interested in hearing that as we go forward from Labour, and I'm also not interested in hearing Labour talk as if they have a monopoly over socialism as well. Well, uh, thank you both for coming on this evening. It's been wonderful to talk to you. Uh, if people wanted to get hold of you on Twitter, what would your handles be? Uh, at Free North Now. For me, it's my personal one. It's Councillor C L L R Dick Cole, or it's uh, maybe in Kernet. Well, thank you both for joining us this evening. If you've enjoyed what you've heard tonight, find us on Medium at Here Life Blog Cymru, on Facebook at Here Life Blog Cymru, and on Twitter at Here Life Blog. Thank you for listening to Here Life. If you like what you heard, please don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review.